Hi, everybody. This is Gretchen Selleck, and I'm here with Annie and Gibbons of uh, Donuts and Pie Fitness. And today we are lucky enough to be speaking with Deborah Atkinson of Flipping 50. And she has been in the fitness industry for over 36 years. And she's helped over 150,000 women flip their second half with vitality and energy that they desire and, and absolutely deserve. And I can completely relate to that. She's the best-selling author of You've Still Got It, Girl, the After 50 Fitness Formula for Women, Navigating Fitness After 50, your GPS for choosing programs and professionals you can trust, and Hot Not Bothered, and I love the name of that, that one. And I've heard Deborah speak at a number of uh, conventions and on webinars, and I don't think that there's anyone more knowledgeable about menopause and fitness over 50 than Deborah. And, and thanks, Deborah, for speaking with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. Excited to meet you both. Love the title of this podcast. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to get right into it. You know, as a personal trainer, and I'm in my, I just turned 64, um, have gone through the whole, I've been doing this for 20 years. I also was taught going through menopause that things would change and you might gain weight. Um, and, but I always stayed active and I never really experienced it and had a lot of clients my age. And I must say, I was even told and even passed along the myth that no matter where you carry your weight previous to menopause, it's all going to go to your belly because that's how we're designed. And there's so much misinformation and people, you know, stop moving and, and they age in their head more than in their body. And then they think it's menopause. Um, so I just want you to talk about more of those myths and bust those myths for us and, and give us your experience in that regard of people going through menopause and what they can do to stay away from that, the myths <laughs> that age them. Yeah, thanks for opening with that because you great, gave such a great segue in your personal testimony to really what happened to you. And the best way for me to relay what I know from both experience and watching so many people for 37 years is better said by a research study. So one that looked at a lot of women, 1 million women over a long period of time, the best kind of research that we can actually look and sink our teeth into by ACOG. So right here in the United States, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists looked at those 1 million women over a long period of time and truly found conclusively that menopause is not related to weight gain. So then the three of us can put our heads together and say, but <laughs> we know there's plenty of evidence that a lot of women gain weight and gain weight in their belly during menopause. So there's no discounting that. And, and we, by the way, are not saying that if you are gaining weight, it's your fault by any means, because there still are a lot of reasons why, why a woman might gain weight. But the truth is the evidence really lies in lifestyle habits. So there may be a small amount of genetics. You can blame your mother and your father for this one a little bit, but then it's really, you know, 95% the epigenetics in your lifestyle habits. So looking at your activity level, if you've gained weight during menopause or since, you know, can you actually say that compared to 10 and 20 years ago, when you were at maybe a more ideal weight that you're as active, can you say that you are, not enjoying cocktails or wine a little bit more now than you were then, that you don't socialize more and or whether that's right now during COVID, the last nine months as we go live is that you know we're closer to the pantry and comfort food has become more attractive and sexy all of a sudden to us. You know, there's so many things that come into play and oh, for a woman, you know, it's not just giving in to those things, but a woman who's not sleeping because of hormone fluctuation and hot flashes or night sweats waking her up, then of course the tendency is going to be to be less active, to maybe exercise, but even do less than she wants to because she doesn't feel good. So there's 
there's a domino effect that can happen there. But ultimately, probably what you described, your own experience, probably mine, is that if we got to menopause already in better condition compared to our peers at the same age, we were probably going to sail through it easier and with less likelihood of gaining weight. Now, hormones don't discriminate. So, you know, even I am constantly course correcting. So I'm kind of in that within about a year or a year and a half of reaching menopause, I'm still noticing, you know, for whatever reason, my GPS is taking me on the winding road that I didn't want to go on. And I've got a course correct all the time. So there's no discrimination. If you are a personal trainer, you're a fitness instructor even, and you're insulted by the fact that you have to deal with this, we do. But lifestyle habits ultimately will be the bottom line. I think it's refreshing and it's a relief to know this is not an automatic assignment that you will gain weight during menopause. So looking for other answers, then all of a sudden becomes more possibility. And we're looking at how can I optimistically deal with this, which is really where we all want to be. You know, it's interesting you say that. It makes me, of course, go through some of the clients and the conversations that I've had with them. And I even, and I'm sure you've experienced this, when people do gain weight and they go to the doctor and they're not quite sure, they're like hoping it's a thyroid thing or they're hoping it's a menopause or they're hoping it's something other than their lifestyle that they can change. And so it just really reinforces the fact that they've had it inside them all along, like uh, Dorothy with the slippers. Um, and it's just as a trainer, you have to convince them of that, that they are in fact in total control Except yeah. for the things, like you say, the hormones that, you know, might make you t more tired or depressed or whatever that is. But like you said, the course correction and just you reinforcing that gives me a whole new dialogue to approach them with. It's really, I appreciate that. It's really yes. informative. It, it, and I also wanted to say, so in that assessment or description, it's like, you know, are you drinking more? potentially right. you were, but also for that woman who's not drinking anymore, who can say, I didn't change anything and it's not working. That's part of what needs to happen. So in that last couple of years of perimenopause, the first couple of years of postmenopause, that two to four year period, it's like, we just went from being on an eight lane interstate to a one lane highway. And we're going through a covered bridge. We've got to have a lot less latitude. We have to steer the right way. So you may not be able to, because of your hormones, you're, you're more susceptible to negative effects of stress and to sugars that you're having. So whether it's from eating or drinking, what used to work is probably not going to. So new rules dictated right. by hormones mean new strategy and we can still win. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was interesting because I uh, asked, actually asked my doctor when I was in uh, a perimenopause, what can I do not to gain weight? And he said, there is nothing you can do, Gretchen. It's inevitable. You're going to gain 20 pounds. <laughs> and I thought, I will show you, buddy. <laughs> and I was already working out every single day and I was fit and I had muscle. And I just thought, how could this happen? And I did not gain the weight. So I, it is not inevitable for, at least for me, but you know, it, for everybody, it's not inevitable. So I thought that was interesting. So you, I remember reading what you said that you have two go-to exercises mm -hmm. um, and what are they and, and why are they your go-to exercises? You know, and we could paint broad terms and, and we can get really narrow, but I love a lunch. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the epitome Deborah, of- Deborah, did you say lunch or lunge? <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you serving, girl? <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, sorry, I had to, go ahead. <laughs> I love lunges. Um, side lunges, rear lunges. Actually, I don't do front lunges unless we're doing walking lunges. Not everybody can do those as easily, but I think it's the epitome of mobility and of muscular strength. 
and we also incorporate some core work in balancing when we're doing a lunge. So finding a way that you can do them. Some people can't step into them because of either, um, say, a bunion or uh, plantar fasciitis, but often you can do a side lunge if you can't do a rear lunge and or you can do a stationary one up and down if you can't step into it and back for knee risk or um, balance issues. There's one that works for all of those ones that don't. There's something that does work for everybody. So that's a favorite for sure. And the other go-to that I really like is a plank. And probably so many of us would say something like that. But what I've begun to realize is even I was probably not being as specific when I would advise that for people prior to maybe a year and a half or so ago, we really need to move something while we're in that lunge. So our core is designed to stabilize, which a plank does beautifully. But once you can hold that plank stable and quiet for about 30 seconds, you really should start moving your arms or moving your legs to the side and back or lifting them up because that's really what your core does. That's when we really call on it the most. So it becomes a more functional plank, if you will. That makes sense. Yeah, I love it does. I, I've recently, I've recently seen a lot, like a lot of people starting to do that. So I think that that is, it, it seems new to me to move around in a plank, but yeah. uh, lately when I'm watching different uh, videos and whatever, you see it a lot more now. So yeah. Yeah. And I think we, we really learned that from, you know, physical therapy. So right. it's, it's always good if we're, we're in the fitness of keeping them from being in physical therapy in the right. first place, if we can help them with prehab and let's do that before they get there. Right. Um, so one last question, and we ask this of everybody is what would your suggestion be or your prescription for aging enthusiastically? have a sense of humor about it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, we really, and of course the, the easy exercise answer is strength train, but I think even before that is, you know, internal jogging. If you can laugh at yourself and realize, you know, all of the, the ways you were poking fun at somebody who was once in your position right now, it becomes a whole lot easier to navigate this place or the next place that we really don't know what is right around the corner. Right. That is, that's, that is, is great. Um, I, I just, I love this interview because you've just, you know that you're giving great information when the person, Gretchen and I listening, um, or think of, of a million people we want to share this with, <laughs> right, Gretchen? Are you thinking oh my of? Gosh. There's so there, yeah, and there's so much more that Deborah even knows that we're just yeah. touching the surface here. A little bit of, it's yeah, so amazing. Oh, thanks, Deborah, so much for speaking with us today. Really oh. appreciate it. Um, we're gonna make sure we share all of your um, social media information and your Flipping Fifty site, um, Flipping Fifty TV. And um, so that everybody can go there and learn more because they'll definitely want to. And then we want to thank everybody for watching. Follow us uh, at Donuts and Pie Fitness, um, like us, and please tell us, how are you aging enthusiastically? Thanks so much. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. It was really nice to talk with you. You still got it, both you girls. <laughs> you too, thanks, bye-bye. <laughs>